I was asked to preach on the parable of the sower, so I would appreciate your input. I've got two of you want the same sermon next week on the, on the wedding banquet, so I really appreciate that input. If you have a sermon you want me to preach, let me know. Today we're going to use Matthew 13, verses 1 to 23. The parable of the sower, which is recorded in Mark and in Luke as well, it's, we believe, the first parable Jesus taught. Matthew 13, that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. The birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, and still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown, he who has ears, let him hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. And then is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn. And I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart, that is, the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred 60 or 30 times what was sown. This is not a moral lesson. It is about the kingdom of God. How the word of God is the deciding, controlling, omnipotent power in your life and in my life as well. And Jesus is using this parable to teach his people. Parables are not for the world. The parables are only for 
Christ's people. And so you have here, when you look at verses 1 and 2, that there's this whole crowd of people following Jesus, and he's gonna, he goes in a boat, and he begins to teach. But this is for the disciples. It's not for any of those people in the crowd. Do you see that? And he tells this story out of the clear blue sky. It appears he says, well, this farmer goes out and he sows seed and he sows it on the path and he sows it on the rocky soil and in the thorns and on the good soil. If you have ears to hear, let him hear. Thank you. And the disciples say in verse 10, they came to him and asked him, why do you speak to the people in parables? If I asked you what a parable is, what would you say? If you were brought up with the same catechism I was brought up in, then I know your answer. It is a heavenly story, no, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. How many of you say that's exactly it? Is that right or wrong? You were taught the truth. <laughs> the word parable comes from a the same root as this word parallel. Because with a parable, you take something you're very familiar with, and being an agricultural community, we're all very familiar with, with, with sowing. And Jesus is saying in all of his parables, what you experience in your daily life is a revelation of what you have in your spiritual life. Would you say that your activity that you are engaged in every day has something in it that reveals the kingdom of heaven. I hope you can say yes to that. Jesus told all kinds of parables, huh? I'm the vine, you are the branch. Well, if you are a husbandman, taking care of an or of a vineyard, I understand what that means. That's very real. I know some of you love animals. You take wonderful care of animals. Does that have anything to do with the kingdom of God in your life? If God so takes care of the bird, and if you so take care of horses and cattle and, and pigs and sheep, how much more does your heavenly Father take care of you? If you are gardening, if you've got to water, you've got to fertilize, you've got to tend the soil, is that a parable of the kingdom of God? It's how God cares for you? As I've been thinking about this sermon all week, I was trying to find some time in my life, every day that I'm doing something that has no characteristic of the reality of the kingdom of heaven. I can't find one. I can't. Because this whole creation every aspect of it, and you and I have our own aspects of, of that creation. You are dealing with what the Word of God has created, 
You have been given a calling. This is my calling. This is, you know, the house I live in. This is the kitchen I work in. This is what I clean. This is the grass I mow. This is the factory I work in. This is the job I have. This is the man I work for. What if every aspect of every moment of every day is a parallel to the kingdom of heaven? The reason that I believe that is because when you get to the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, in verses 10 to 17, those secrets are not revealed to the world. The world can look at a sunset say, wow, that's really beautiful. It's amazing. When you and I look at a sunset in all this polluted air, they're even more beautiful. You say, God, that is so beautiful. Your work, your handiwork, how Glorious, how wise, how, how wonderful. This is your pleasure. And you are looking at that sunset and you are enjoying it with God. That's a secret of the kingdom. And if you make pizza and you put on all these wonderful herbs and spices and all these cheeses and it is so delicious. And you say, God, this is so wonderful. Your power, your wisdom, I just enjoy. I don't think there's anything in your life that you can say is divorced from the word of God. So the secrets of the kingdom are those things which God's people alone enjoy, and one of those is knowing God. Knowing He's your creator. Knowing He has your life all written in His book. Knowing He is for you. Knowing He is orchestrating everything in your life for your good, knowing you'll stand before him uncondemned, knowing that he has opened your eyes and he has opened your ears. That's the secret of the kingdom of God. When you look at verse 11, Jesus answers and says, well, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, not to them. I am the everlasting God. I chose you before the creation of the world that you would know the secrets of the kingdom. Verse 12, whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken from him. That can be confusing, and it doesn't seem fair. Why does the one who is given be given more and more and more and more? It's because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you. And you're going to have more understanding. You're going to have more interest in the Word of God. You're going to walk with God. You're going to have fellowship with God. But God says it this way, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And your knowledge, 
your wisdom, your being drawn to God gets richer and richer and richer. That doesn't mean that you never have famines in your life. But there is this richness that you say, my life is so wonderful, God. I love your word. My sheep hear my voice, he says. And they follow me. Follow, it doesn't mean just tagging along. Follow means they sit at his feet. You are with him. You're listening. And then he says, whoever does not have even what he has will be taken from him. That's what God says. I give mercy to those I will have mercy. I harden whom I want to harden. That's God's revelation of himself. And you can kick about that if you want. It's going to do you any good. You should rejoice, Paul says, that your name is in heaven. And it makes all the difference in the world. And so, so Jesus says, uh, this is why I speak to them in parables, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand, and then is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, you will be ever hearing, never understanding, you will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. You can look at the same sunset and have somebody sitting next to you Go to see the same thing, but they are not maybe going to see this is God. This is his glory. This is his pleasure. That's how it is. You and I have what we call biblical glasses. We see everything from a biblical perspective. We think biblically. The secular mind has secular glasses and they see through an evolutionary model. They see through a humanistic model. And God has decreed that's exactly what they will see. And Jesus says their hearts are callous. They hardly hear. They hardly see. And he says, if, I would, if that would change, you know, I would heal them. Verse 16 but he says, blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Why do the disciples see Jesus? Why do they follow him? Because God has opened their eyes. And that's true with you and with me. We didn't decide to follow Jesus. He opened our eyes. And we, and he draws us to him. Verse 17, that right, the, the things that the prophets and the righteous men of old, they saw all the things that pointed to Jesus, the temple, the sacrifices, the table of showbread, the candlestick, the altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant. All of these ceremonies pointed to Jesus. The disciples see and hear Jesus' lie. Then, the seed, what is that seed? The seed, according to Luke 8, 11, very simple. The seed is the word of God. And who is the word of God? Jesus. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So when is the seed planted? It is planted at creation. Amen. All creation has the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the purpose of creation. He doesn't come into a, a pre-existing world. He creates the world. It's his covenants with all things. It's his laws. It's his beauty. 
You have never touched anything that he did not create. But there's another sense. He is in your heart. It's another thing. How can Christ the creator, the farmer, you know, make the field and now he's sowing himself into the hearts of people. That's what we're looking at here. And so this seed is alive, this seed is well, and that's what you have. Now there are four kinds of soil that we're going to be looking at, and the first one that we're going to be looking at is number 19, question, or, uh, verse 19. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So why in the world does this farmer sow seed on the path? You don't do that anymore, right? With your GPS? Everything you plant is planted in good soil. Jesus is not talking about soil. He's talking about hearts. And there are some stony hearts that he turns into great soil. Understand? I will give you a heart of flesh. But the, the the seed that lands on the path is very interesting. In screw tape, C.S. Lewis writes screw tape letters. Screw tape writes to Wormwood, his little practice devil, and says, Isn't it funny how mortals always picture us as putting things into their minds? He says, In reality, our best work is done by keeping things out of their minds. C.S. Lewis, God gave him such insight. A darkened mind is a mind that is closed to the light. And Jesus tells his disciples, when you are doing evangelism, teaching and preaching, there will be some characters in your audience that are that kind of person. Keep teaching. Keep preaching. Today we would call them people that are so distracted. Social media. I don't know how many hours you spend on it in a week. I find it frustrating, don't you? Netflix. There are all kinds of ways we can consume our time. That is the path. The rocky places. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. Understand, it's not the rocky soil that's the problem. It's because he has no root. He was at some evangelism meeting. It's some revival meeting. And he hears this, wow, this really sounds great. I think I'll just walk up there and join the, the, the whole crew. Well, then a month or two or three or maybe years later. Okay, so I, I thought this would really, I thought I'd get rich. I thought my life would be easy. I thought this would be so satisfying. I can't go on this way. I can't live for myself. I can't do this. I can't be giving my money to this or that. 
I need my own life. And then he gets persecuted, poked fun of, and he falls away. Now I want you to know something. Not everybody does. There are people who fall away and they come back. There's this thing called deconversion. Have you heard deconversion? There is no such thing. You cannot be given to Christ by God and then get out of it. It's no problem. Anyone who has been converted biblically will never deconvert. Although we can deceive people for years. Do all the things. We can even write spiritual songs. We can even be a pastor. And we never, never have any root. And so Jesus says to the disciples, when you're teaching, you're going to have people in your audience that are, they have no root. Your and my trials do not make us or break us. I've said that before. Your trials, your difficulties, your persecutions, which I really doubt we have any, reveal the depth of the root of your faith. It's amazing. I know some of you really well and I, I respect you. What you have gone through and here you sit in church singing to God, praising God, knowing the secrets of the kingdom. It isn't you it's the effect of the word of God in your life. And then you have this gang here that, that's amongst the thorns, 22. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it and make it unfruitful. These are your senior citizens, okay? They've been in church all their life. But there's a problem. It doesn't say that the thorns killed their faith. The thorns which Jesus is talking about, one of those thorns is wealth. Do you see that? Wealth is not a thorn. But it can be. Because wealth has two problems. Disadvantages. One of them is when you have wealth, you have a lot of concerns. You've got a lot of responsibilities. I gotta manage it, I gotta watch over it, I don't want to lose it. I, I, people can get old that way. The other disadvantage of wealth is that it brings into our life what can be overwhelming pleasure. I can have anything I want. I can enjoy whatever I want because I've got it. What destroys these middle-aged, older Christian people, and so we say Christians, people who've been in church, is that they did not discipline the thorn. It doesn't say wealth destroyed them. It's the deceitfulness of wealth. 
ah, I think I can be in church and I think I can live this way. I think I've got this balance. And it won't work. James speaks about how people have pierced themselves because of what? Holding social status. I have to this comfort, this security. And then you have that wonderful thing. Oh, by the way, you don't have to have the wealth for it to deceive you. You can be in such a state that you have this goal in your life. I'm going to be this rich. I'm going to have this house. I'm going to drive this vehicle. I'm going to take these vacations. You don't have to have it. You can be working for it all your life and it takes you into the worldly direction the soil that is rich is the soil that has been plowed and broken by the farmer and when the seed didn't talk much about seed, but it's a seed. It's the living, active Word of God, quietly planted. When you plant seeds, you don't make a lot of noise, I don't think. It's very quiet. And when it's planted, it's corn, you can see, but if you're planting radish seeds, you can't find it, right? It's a seed in your heart. And by God's power, by God's grace, you will produce fruit. And that fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. You are full of love and full of joy and full of peace and full of kindness and full of gentleness and full of faithfulness. You're a blessing in the world, same place we were last week. That oil in your land is what you have done that demonstrates I am a child of God. He blesses me and I will bless you. And I want to say one more thing. It does not say the good soil does not have rocks. It does not say the good soil does not have thorns. It does not say the good soil doesn't have a path. It is saying all of these, the path, the thorns, the rocks, do not stop this soil from producing. I'm still a sinner. I am still attracted to the world and to wealth. Things that I can be very shallow. Your life also. But by the grace of God, you and I are going to bear fruit. May God bless His word. Amen. Our Father, we praise and glorify you for teaching us that your word in our life bears fruit because we belong to you and all of the things that should hinder us cannot because nothing separates us from your love. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.